Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back once again to the Siege of Vrax. Things were beginning to look rather dire for the Death Corps of Krieg on the planet, but now, with the reinforcements that had just arrived, led by their brand new Supreme Commander, Marshal Kagori, things were starting to look up again for the first time in over a year. A year filled with nothing but setbacks and repeated defeats and withdrawals for the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. And indeed, the simple fact that they were still there was a small miracle in and of itself. Ably helped, no doubt, by the fact that their adversaries were almost as busy bickering and fighting with one another as they were fighting the Death Corps. The worshippers of Nurgle had already put themselves quite apart from the various other traitor forces by attacking and breaking into some of the Cardinal's armories and stealing many of the biological and chemical weapons within for their own nefarious uses. As for the followers of Khorne, unsurprisingly, they were not the most cooperative of allies either, especially now that the cornered Warlords of Four had established control over most, if not indeed all, of the various cornered warbands, making him by far the single most powerful warlord on the planet. And as for the Iron Warriors, they had simply shut themselves off in their own reinforced trenches, and woe betide anyone who disturbed them without a very, very good reason. And as the influence of his new chaotic allies grew and grew, the Cardinal's own influence shrank and shrank. Until the good Cardinal must have begun to worry, about not only his own position, but indeed his very own existence on the planet that supposedly had risen up in his name. This divide amongst the traitor forces undoubtedly played a part in explaining why the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was even a fighting force at all, seeing as not only was it cut off from reinforcements and resupply, but it was also essentially trapped. The enemy could simply travel back up into orbit and strike against the Death Corps wherever they chose, whilst the Death Corps needed to stay huddled up beneath their mobile shield generators or risk annihilation from orbit. Not to mention the simple fact that whilst, to begin with, the Death Corps severely outgunned their enemies, now it was quite the other way around. Whilst the Death Corps undoubtedly still possessed, at the very least, local superiority in artillery, they had nothing that could match up against the enemy's titans. And the God Machines could surely have trampled the entire army into the Vraxian mud, if only they had been directed and organised in a suitable manner. Now, don't get me wrong, god machines are near unstoppable monsters, literal gods of war, but they must nevertheless be directed in a fashion that makes sense, and against the massed gun lines of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army and the still remaining Shadow Swords, they would have to be deployed with considerable caution and expertise, otherwise even their mighty void shields would soon flicker out and die beneath a sustained artillery barrage. And at that point, all it would require was one lucky hit from a shadow sword, turning the main command bridge into a hell of molten slag and running metal, or fusing a leg joint solid, and suddenly, the behemoth war machine would find itself toppling towards the ground, where its very weight would ensure it would be shattered to a thousand pieces upon contact with the soil. But of course, at this point, the enemy frankly did not need their god machines to inflict a permanent defeat upon the Death Corps. They still had hundreds, possibly thousands, of heretical Astartes, along with tens of thousands and at this point probably millions of cultists, all of which could be equipped from the vast Vraxian armories. And then of course on top of that came the Vraxian Defence Force itself, which at this point was a hardened elite military formation. And yet, the only attacks that the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army suffered were minor ones, 
There were a few set-piece battles here and there, the occasional escalade, and ground most certainly was lost, but considering their situation, the Death Court had been placed under very little pressure, which again almost certainly was due to the disunited nature of the Chaos Forces. On the one hand, there was unquestionably prestige and status to be gained from attacking and gaining ground away from the Death Corps, but on the other, that increase in prestige had to be measured against the cost in casualties, because of course a Warlord's ultimate authority comes from the size and power of his warband, and thusly every casualty also meant a decrease in that overall authority. Now, some casualties were easy to replace, like mere cultists or foot soldiers that could be lured away from the civilian population or even the PDF forces of Vrax, but casualties amongst the traitor Astartes forces, however, those were virtually irreplaceable. And with cutthroat competition on every side, this quickly whittled down the warband's numbers, even when they were not fighting the true enemy. Of course, this struggle for power would eventually come to a resolution, as it had already somewhat begun to do, with the Cornered Warlord Zephor gathering all of the various Cornered Warbands under his overall command. In response to this, Cardinal Zaphon had also begun husbanding his own resources. The Disciples of Zaphon under the command of Deacon Mamoon took on a new role, they would now also begin to reduce the influence of their new friends. Of course, the true faith would still be taught and spread, but it would be the correct version of the new faith, the one officially endorsed and ordained by the Cardinal, and not this newfangled version brought in by the outsiders. More overt military measures were also put in place, the PDF forces and the true Vraxian loyalists were to isolate themselves as much as possible from their new allies. Areas of responsibilities would be divided between them and their friends, and of course the armories would be placed under increased guard. In case, once again, any of their new allies got a little bit too grabby with the goods. This was, however, a difficult and dangerous tightrope for the Cardinal to tread. On the one hand, he needed to increase his own power and influence, preferably at the cost of his new allies. But on the other hand, he was also painfully aware of the military might of his new friends, and could not risk upsetting them needlessly. If it came to a contest of arms, the Cardinal's forces would almost certainly come up short in that confrontation, if they could even be cajoled into fighting in the first place. The various PDF troops may, in theory, be loyal, but loyalty only stretches so far, especially in the face of a hulking cornet berserker. The Cardinal would have to come up with something soon. Or well, the Death Corps wouldn't be the only ones having chaos issues. But at least the Cardinal could take some solace in the fact that he was not the only one that had to worry about politics. Marshal Kagori, who had so recently arrived in orbit above Vrax, was beginning the lengthy process of delivering his reinforcements down onto the planet below. The first time the Death Corps of Krieg had arrived on Vrax, they had spent an entire year building up the necessary logistical infrastructure with which to transport the army down onto the surface, and then begin moving it towards the Vraxian defences. Undoubtedly, Marshal Kagori would have loved to have had such an abundance of time on his hands, but sadly, he did not. For whilst Lord Commander Jolke had been given 12 years to achieve the subjugation of Vrax, Marshal Kagori was expected to do the same in less than two, and one of those years had already passed whilst marshalling the very reinforcements now being unloaded down onto the planet.
What was even worse was that the less than entirely successful naval battle against the Anarchy's heart had handed his enemies a not inconsiderable quantity of ammunition with which to fire at him. Minor and of course utterly irrelevant details such as the fact that Marshal Kagori was of course in no way shape or form in command of the Imperial Navy elements or that he had no hand in how much of the Imperial Navy force would be deployed were all conveniently ignored. Luckily this was not Marshal Kagori's first dance with a somewhat unwilling opponent and he had come prepared. He had enlisted the services of a squadron of Tetrarch Super Heavy Landers to ferry his forces down onto the planet. These vessels are amongst the largest landing vehicles in the Imperium, only really outsized by the truly monstrous Titan Heavy Landers designed to bring the god machines themselves down onto the battlefield, and a single Tetrarch Super Heavy transport can bring with it an entire company, regardless of whether or not it is infantry, mechanized or armored, and as an added bonus, the transport itself is heavily armed and armored, able to effectively engage the enemy whilst landing and also while deploying its reinforcement troops directly onto the battlefield. Of course, Marshal Kagori was not intending to use them in quite such an offensive manner, because regardless of how heavily armed and armoured the thing might be, well, the enemy had some rather big guns of their very own, and he didn't have a lot of these landers. But if something should happen, if a sudden enemy thrust were to break through the front lines and threaten the landing zones, these vessels would be by far the best suited to deal with that potential eventuality. Their ability to transport truly astounding quantities of men, material, equipment and general supplies was also a supremely valuable commodity in a situation like the present, when time was most assuredly of the essence. And so, with all possible alacrity, the fleet in orbit began unloading its reinforcements. Tens of thousands of replacement personnel for the various line corps, thousands of tanks, and millions of tons of supplies, food, ammunition, and additional power packs. Not to mention billions of barrels of Prometheum for the ever-hungry armoured elements of the 88th. But most significant of all were of course the titans of Legio Astorum, being deployed to the battlefield via their own super heavy landers. The titans would be commanded in the field by their own High Principe Rand Drauka, who brought with him a total of 10 Reva class titans and 12 warhounds, for a total of 22 war machines. The Titans would, for the time being, be kept in reserve, and would only be deployed on the say-so of their High Princeps, Rand Drauka. The Adeptus Mechanicus elements that had come along with them would have quite a lot of work to do yet before the battle group was fully operational. The War Machines would have to be roused fully from their long slumbers and brought back into fully operational status. Additionally, the logistical and support network infrastructure to support uh, the Titans of Legio Astorum would have to be constructed from the ground up, as this system would remain entirely independent from that of the 88th. The battle group's immediate needs would be met by the Super Heavy Landers, which were able to operate as de facto repair and supply docks for the god machines for an extended period of time but a fully operational logistical system would have to be constructed, not only to bring in supplies, spare parts and replacement materiel and men from orbit, but also to service the more esoterical functions of the battle group. Remember, a titan is not merely a war machine, it is by all accounts a god of war and like any deity, it requires certain special accommodations. Interestingly, there was no response from within the Vraxian lines to the arrival of these reinforcements, 
One can reasonably assume that the Anarchy's heart had communicated not only the fact that reinforcements were on the way, but also the likely composition of these reinforcements, judging by the transports involved. The Adeptus Mechanicus Super Heavy Transport, for example, would be a pretty damn dead giveaway that enemy titans were on the way to play. But, whilst it would almost be certain that the Anarchy's heart sent some form of report, the disunited nature of the defenders might mean that said report was not available to all the various interest groups on Vrax. Indeed, the arrival of Imperial reinforcements in such quantity and strength could easily have come as quite the surprise to many of the interested parties. This possibility seems even more likely when one considers who was ultimately in command of the Anarchy's heart. It was of course the flagship of Lord Arcos of the Alpha Legion, and ever since the arrival of the Chaos reinforcements, the Alpha Legion had become ever more ephemeral, ever less a tangible part of Vraxian politics. Whereas Lord Arcos had once been one of the Cardinal's closest confidants, and one of his most ardent whisperers and influencers, these days Lord Arcos was very difficult to get a hold of. He was always away somewhere in the field, or otherwise occupied. It might appear as if the Lord of the Alpha Legion's plans were entering a new phase, one in which it might be prudent for him to separate himself to a certain degree from the renegade cardinal. Regardless of the reason, however, I am sure that Marshal Kagori was very appreciative of the respite so generously offered up to him, as now he would be able to deploy his reinforcements in relative peace and quiet. He had undoubtedly feared that the enemy would make a concerted effort to disrupt the reinforcement process, and maybe even try and bag themselves some valuable kills. If they were to down a Tetrarch Super Heavy, for example, that is an entire company of reinforcements wiped out before they could ever have fought. And God Emperor help the good Marshal if they managed to bag themselves a Titan Super Heavy lander. The Adeptus Mechanicus have been known to withdraw the support of their Titan Legions for far less than such clear and abject negligence. And to be entirely honest, Marshal Kagori probably had more than enough work on his plate already without an inconsiderate foe adding to his already considerable workload. Because even whilst the reinforcements were being sent down to the planet as quickly as humanly possible, that was but the start of the problems. Of course, Marshal Kagori had not been idle during the year it had taken to marshal the reinforcement flotilla and its various elements. He had been planning for how exactly he was to break the deadlock when he finally arrived upon Vrax. Of course, the situation that he had originally envisaged, and the situation that he actually found the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army in, was, um, different, shall we say, so his plans would have to be adjusted, and in certain areas completely reworked. But the general idea remained the same. The first step would be to retake all of the land lost during the last year of fighting, but of course, this would be a rather extensive undertaking, and before it could really get underway, all of the various Alliance Corps would have to be fully reinforced and resupplied, not to mention reorganized. Tens of thousands of men and thousands of vehicles, in addition to the Titans themselves, would all need fitting into the battle line, which meant shuffling around all of the previous formations, redrawing positions, reorganizing the overall command structure, and also, of course, shaking out the last few loyalists to Lord Commander Julka, whilst also making sure that none of those in the Marshal's command staff of split loyalties could get too much of a say in the matter. Regimental commanders, quartermasters, and the various supply officers of the Imperial Navy had quite the task in front of them, and many would have to work day and night for weeks at a time with very little rest to reorganize and prepare for the upcoming struggle. 
There was also the unfortunate fact that the spaceports were simply no longer operational, and since once again they did not have access to the industrial sized spaceports that had been so thoroughly ruined by the Dark Angels, that made everything even slower, as the various infrastructure facilities would have to be rebuilt. Additionally, the emergency shelters and storage facilities built by the 88th during the year in which they had been isolated from the rest of the Imperium would now have to be relocated, redug, and expanded upon to house the new reinforcements and supplies. And unfortunately for the 88th, their honeymoon period of peace with the Defenders was also going to end after only a short while longer. Realising that the enemy was preparing for yet another major effort on Vrax, the Defenders once again began escalating their own efforts to interfere with the enemy's preparations. This meant that yet further supplies and reinforcements would have to be brought in continuously whilst preparations were being made for the next great offensive. These supplies and reinforcements would also have to be husbanded very carefully as their transports would be far less frequent than during the heydays of the original invasion, since the Anarchy's heart, whilst badly wounded, was still lurking, presumably, somewhere within the system. Thusly, any further reinforcements and supplies would have to be escorted all the way in from the system's edge and to Vrax itself, whilst the supply ships already at Vrax were also have to be guarded by their own escort flotillas. The situation on the ground was even more complicated. New regiments and formations would have to be moved around and old ones replaced or moved to other positions along the line, and all of this would also be have to be carried out under the constant threat of enemy intervention, meaning that a company could not simply just be moved wholesale, rather the replacement company would first have to be moved into position close by the front line and then rushed into position as the old company was equally rushed out of their positions. All of this, of course, once again under the constant supervision of enemy artillery observers, making it an extremely hazardous operation at the best of times. And then of course there were the newcomers. The Titans themselves were a rather large inconvenience for Marshal Kagori from a command standpoint, since of course the Titans, under the command of their High Principe, were entirely outside of his own command structure. The best that Marshal Kagori could do was to suggest and request the cooperation of the Titan battle groups, and acquiring that cooperation is far from the most speedy of endeavours. Now, some field commanders will, after lengthy deployment periods alongside Deptus Mechanicus or Titan forces, develop a certain rapport with their counterparts amongst the Admech or the Titan legions, and this can certainly speed things along, but at this particular point, the relationship between High Princeps Rand Drauka and Marshal Kigori was in its infancy and neither truly had the measure of the other. There is a deep-seated mistrust of the Adeptus Mechanicus within the Imperial Guard, and an equally deep-seated mistrust of the Guard within the Adeptus Mechanicus. This all springs from the fact that the two formations have wildly different ways of operating, and in many cases substantial differences of opinion. For example, when it comes to religion, battlefield etiquette, who should be in command of whom, strategy, tactics, and the best employment of limited resources. And then of course there is the command structure of the Titan Legion itself to be considered. Titan legions all operate with a considerable degree of autonomy, independence, and their own particular peculiarities. In the case of Lego Astorum, it was a rather interesting formation, since apparently it took almost all of its directives when it came to overall strategy and decision making directly from the Forge Masters of Lucius. This meant that if Marshal Kagori wanted the cooperation of Legio Astorum, he had to go about getting it in a remarkably roundabout fashion. Rather than simply heading over to whatever lovely abode that High Princeps Rand Drauke had set up on planet, he would essentially have to contact his bosses on the Forge world of Lucius.
And of course, that contact was not allowed to be something so simple as a request for aid, for example, where the marshal simply said, hello there, cogboys, could I get your titans to help me here, 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 and here, at round about these given times on that and that date? No, 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 of course not. That would be far far too simple. Instead, any communique with the Masters of the Forge World would have to go through a tortured and complicated and interwoven web of aides, representatives, and forms of etiquette and proper diplomatic accord. And it was also considered extraordinarily impertinent for any Imperial Guard commander to lay out a set of instructions or suggestions as to how the Forge Masters of Lucius were to act at any given point, time, or even just in general. This meant that Marshal Kagori could not simply draw a line on the map and say, please place Titans here. Instead, Marshal Kagori's only real way of influencing the Forge Masters was to present them with his own battle plans, and hopefully make them of such a simple and direct nature that the Forge Masters themselves would look upon them and go, ah, yes, place Titans there. We get it, and this was totally our idea, by the way, and we will be taking any credit for any achievements on the behalf of our Titans, obviously. As you can probably tell, this uniquely convoluted and retarded way of communication meant that when Kagori was drawing up his plans, he had to do so without any real idea of where his greatest source of firepower would actually be deployed. And so, with the strategic occurrence of having both arms bound behind one's back, whilst simultaneously having one's ears filled with salmon paste, Marshal Kagori would have to draw up one general plan, and then, without any further feedback or information, possibly for months and months at a time, draw up dozens upon dozens of sub-plans, based upon every conceivable placement and disposition of, quote-unquote, his... Titans. And of course, the diplomatic nonsense does not stop there. If the inane, pointless driveling of a conclave of ancient semi-senile Mechanicus tech adepts is not enough to already drive one screaming up the wall, there is also the Imperial Aeronautica elements to be considered, as those of course were also not under the command of Marshal Kagori. They were under the command of the Imperial Navy elements in system. On the bright side, at least the Marshal could speak to his counterpart in the Imperial Navy directly, unlike within the Adeptus Mechanicus. And not only was he allowed to make suggestions of the Imperial Aeronautica, he was even allowed to make requests. Which by and large made it one hell of a smoother cooperation operation than anything he could hope to achieve with the Forge Masters of Lucius. Unfortunately, however, there were certain fairly strict limitations on what exactly the Imperial Aeronautica would be able to do in support of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army, and these were limitations that its commanders were fully aware of and intent on keeping in mind. Whilst the Varax had certainly been at the receiving end of one hell of a battering for the last decade or so, it was still in possession of the same tremendous quantity of anti-aircraft defences that had ruled out Imperial Aeronautica assistance to the original inception of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. If the Imperial Aeronautica services were to play an overly active role in the siege, they would in all due likelihood simply be shot out of the sky, whilst inflicting tragically little in the way of real damage upon the Vraxian defenders. Even a full-blown campaign of strategic bombing was unlikely to produce all that much in the way of real results, and the cost of such a campaign would be astronomical. The Marauder Bomber is a tough beast and make no mistake about it, but the sheer quantity of fuck you don't fly here that was available to the Varaxian defenders would test even its endurance to the limits and well and truly beyond them.
Instead, the Imperial Aeronautica forces would contend themselves with maintaining aerial superiority over the 88's own lines, and contesting any attempts made by the enemy to bomb or inflict further annoyance upon the Death Corps of Krieg. The bombing elements of the Imperial Navy would also be employed in targeted attacks during major offensive operations, providing that the Imperial Guard elements would be able to support the advancing bomber wings with suppression of enemy air defences, via repeated and targeted artillery barrages against located centres of enemy anti-aircraft artillery. Marshal Kagori clearly had a fair bit of respect and admirations for the Imperial Navy's fighter and bomber pilots as he went to great lengths in aiding their operations and including their forces in the planning process of his upcoming offensive. And I suspect that the aeronautical officers themselves were quite taken aback at the audacity, the drive and the ingenuity displayed by Marshal Kagori, as he suggested the bombers in particular be deployed in a very unconventional fashion. Marshal Kagori had not planned anything even remotely like a sustained strategic bomber offensive. Oh no, he would make use of the Imperial Navy's Marauder bombers in a very different fashion. But that will have to wait until next episode, which will also be this week, since this was a bit of a shorter administrative episode, we will be looking at the offensive itself along with its preparation and execution in the next episode. Until then, I have been Arch, thank you all very much so for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.